Thank you, Tullio. Thanks also for the invitation. Thanks for putting together such an exciting and interesting program. I hope we're going to have lively discussion, so I'm pretty sure that we will have excellent presentation, but a meeting also lists from the participation. So please ask questions, make this a lively and interesting discussion. With that, I would like to announce the first speaker, which is Professor Mark Rubin. Um, he's director of the Department for Biomedical Research at the University of Bern, where he serves two purposes. The first is um, to provide the researchers of the Inselspital Bern University Hospital with the best possible working environment and infrastructure for translational research. We agree this is very important, but this is most likely not the dominant reason why we invited you here. You have your research focus in prostate cancer and we would love to hear what you've do, been doing in this environment in the last years. Thanks for agreeing to come and to discuss about genomic testing for clinical decision making in patients with advanced prostate cancer. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, just a few disclosures. I'm going to be talking about um, risk assessment for prostate cancer. I'll focus on advanced cancer. I think one of the things that I realize uh, in an international setting is that some of the comments I make may not be applicable to all countries, so I think we should be careful about that. I might use terms like FDA, which is uh, applicable to the United States. And the other is that I'm going to try to keep, even though my area of interest is in prostate cancer research, basic research and translational, I'm going to focus on what we think are recommendations that can be clinically applicable. And that is a, a, a paper that will be coming out in the ISEP journal, uh, ISEP uh, group for in the in a pathology journal, but it will be really describing what we think are some of the recommendations from the perspective of molecular pathology. So in prostate cancer, unlike lung cancer or some leukemias where we have a lot of uh, targetable mutations. So we've known about alterations in prostate cancer for a long time, and we have much fewer opportunities for targeted therapy. Obviously, the androm receptor being one of the earliest recognized types of targeted therapy and continues to be a main target for prostate. But unlike lung cancer, where we have many di molecular diagnostic tests, uh, it's been much more challenging in prostate cancer. So I'll take us through a little bit of this. Now, uh, obviously, in clinically localized disease, one of the challenges is we're taking samples of a tumor at the early stages, and here, as we're demonstrating, we can have all sorts of scenarios where you have a lot of tumor, it might be uh, Gleason 6, uh, and then moving all the way to higher grades, but you may only have a very small amount of that tumor. And so just a few comments about localized uh, tumors and Gleason grading. So one thing that we know over the past few years is a movement more towards Gleason risk groups. And the reason being is, is that from a clinical perspective, I think pathology wanted to really look at Gleason 6 and below as a category of low risk, and then obviously the higher Gleason scores as being ones of high risk. And I just want to, as a, as a, as a complement to that, you can see that what happens is as you go from the low Gleason risk groups to the higher ones, and this is showing copy number alterations or molecular changes, and you can see it actually corresponds very nicely with increasing Gleason grades. So there is a good correspondence with changes that occur molecularly as you go to higher grades. So that's a very strong system. But going back to the biopsies where we see different amounts of tumor in different grades and really going to an example of a prostatectomy that's been taken out, and we have areas that have been circled where we have different Gleason grades and different uh, patterns of growth, you can see here that the tumor may look different, so different grades, different growth patterns. We also may have different molecular alterations. For example, this area does not have a gene fusion, whereas the others do. And here, P53, which is associated with more aggressive disease, is seen altered in some of the samples, but not all the samples. And we also have a patient now who's gone on many years later from the initial uh, prostatectomy to go on to metastasize. And we can try to then identify which of the lesions is the one that led to that. And so what we represent here is really an example where uh, at the time of localized disease, probably we have the information to tell us what is the most aggressive component. But when we think about biopsying, we may not necessarily capture that. So heterogeneity is obviously a very important topic in prostate cancer. 
I'm going to be talking mostly about genomic testing, which is thinking about the somatic lesion, so thinking about the tumor. But we're, we are going to be thinking about uh, genetics, because it's obviously going to be very important to think about germline changes, particularly with DNA repair alterations. Um, there are a number of tests that are available commercially, and I'm, as an American uh, living in Switzerland, I'm, I'm very familiar with the American uh, focus on a lot of these tests in Europe that they may not be as popular, and there's some other tests that I haven't uh, mentioned here. I'll make a few comments about that, but I think the important thing is we'll be focusing more on advanced disease. The other thing is, is that we can think about biomarkers that we're looking at as both prognostic and predictive, and in the setting of prognostic biomarkers where we're thinking about how well a patient's going to do, there's a lot of information that we have at our hands. So we have clinical information, pathology information that tells us how patients are going to do. I think in the area of advanced cancer, we're really trying to develop predictive biomarkers, that is, biomarkers that are going to tell us which patients are going to respond to therapy so that we can optimize the clinical uh, uh, therapy a sequence uh, and prevent patients from going on therapies that are not going to be effective. And just to uh, remind us, when we develop these tests, they have to have certain features. So if we're developing a molecular test, even though I won't discuss it for each test, they have to be accurate and reproducible and sensitive and specific. And one of the problems that we're seeing in many research meetings, is not, it's, it's not uh, a problem per se for research, but for clinical application is that many of the markers are interesting but not potentially reproducible or from lab to lab. And so this has actually been a tremendous limitation in moving biomarkers from discovery into actual clinical application. There are a number of types of samples that can be collected. So the easiest samples are either something like a buccal swab, which might be for germline DNA, or maybe a blood sample. Uh, tumor samples are readily accessible in prostate from radical prostatectomies or from biopsies. And in the area of advanced cancer, we're seeing more and more examples of the centers that are performing metastatic biopsies. And this has uh, been extremely informative. And the question in the future is whether there'll be more and more biopsies. And, and I think towards the end, you'll see why I think this is important. We talk about mutations, and I think it's important when we start doing very uh, extensive genomic testing for patients with prostate and other cancers, we have to think about levels of uh, mutations. So there's some mutations we might call level one mutations where they're associated with an FDA-approved drug. And one example might be in lung cancer, EGFR mutations that are associated with a very clear pathway to how you treat a patient. And then there are other levels, and moving all the way down to uh, research-grade observations, where it's a mutation that may be interesting, but not clinically applicable. And so these, this is being something that's formalized in the context of precision medicine. Um, and for prostate, we really have a very few opportunities uh, for these level one uh, categories, and I'll talk about that at the end. But we have a lot more in the level two that need to be considered for level one. It's also important to remember that a mutation in one cancer type may not be actionable in another. So I just mentioned lung cancer, uh, but we also have BRAF mutations that in some settings are uh, actionable, in other settings may be not actionable. And therefore, it's important to know not only what type of mutation, but what is the type of tumor. There are a number of tests that are available, and I think this is a, uh, it represents great opportunity, but also creates a lot of questions for clinicians and pathologists, molecular pathologists, how to interpret the data. Many of these uh, tests, this is an example of foundation tests that have uh, very sophisticated reports and just an example of a type of report that you could see. We also have an example of Oncotype DX. There are a number of, of these various tests that are available that help both inform the clinician and the patient as to the risk factors that they may have. Um, and what might be the next course of therapy. So this is actually quite important uh, for uh, good communication about what the risks are. So now I'm going to talk about some of the recommendations, and I'll go through some of the areas where we think are the most promising molecular tests for both a, a, a localized but also aggressive cancer. And some of these you'll have known for not only five or 10 years, but maybe even 20 years or more. 
And the first is uh, key 67. So looking at the proliferation of the tumor, this is an example of a localized tumor uh, having either high proliferation or another with a lower proliferation, and P10. So P10, uh, part of a pathway that leads to activation of AKT and downstream signaling. And the, the assessment of these two biomarkers are considered extremely promising, as an example by immunostochemistry or by FISH. And the consensus of view was really that both appear to be extremely important, and we know that there are uh, new um, drugs coming down the line that, that are really promising in the P3 pathway, P3 kinase pathway for advanced disease. Um, and so um, even though after many, many years of using these assays, they haven't really been accepted in clinical use. And so this is something that's on the verge of being used, but we don't, we don't actually report this regularly. There may be centers that use these uh, genes, but I would say that probably P10 is going to become important, but it's just not there yet. There are a number of tests that I mentioned that are molecular, uh, molecular tests that are available, Oncotype DX, uh, Polaris test, Decipher. There are others. I'm only mentioning a few. I don't want to exclude everyone, but I can also include all of them. And what they're trying to do is get at some aspect of alterations at the transcript level, so it's looking at RNA. And one of the problems is, is that many of these signatures are potentially beneficial in certain settings. Um, the improvement of these tests uh, may be there, but it also has to be assessed in the context of immunostochemistry. And some of uh, these uh, signatures really need to be assessed for the issue of heterogeneity. And I'll just give you an example of a recently published work from um, University of Michigan where what they did is they created a, a broad assay that captured all of these different types of tests. And they asked the question, uh, what happens with, uh, in the setting of heterogeneity? And I'll just ask you to look at these two examples. So these are two prostatectomies. They've circled areas um, that are numbered where they have different uh, lesions, and then they've looked at the molecular uh, lesions here. So this is example three, and this is example uh, from number one, where what we see is a, a tremendous range of expression depending on where you took a biopsy. And so this demonstrates really that a lot of these molecular signatures are potentially useful, but they suffer the same problems of, of heterogeneity and sampling. So, the, so really from the perspective of the pathology consensus group, we felt that although they're interesting, um, the, uh, these, um, these biomarkers uh, assessed by RNA are probably um, still uh, liable to, to sampling, and so that's a major problem. So now I'll talk about some predictive biomarkers. And I think this is one of the areas that is going to be most important, um, and that is the area of DNA repair uh, deficiency markers. There are already guidelines for how to deal with this in the U.S., and I'm not as familiar with the different countries in Europe, uh, how they vary, but basically patients who have very high uh, Gleason gray tumors or very high PSA would be recommended or considered for having DNA testing of germline alterations such as BRCA, BRCA1 or 2 or ATM, germline mutations. Um, and obviously when that occurs, it has to be done in the context of genetic counseling. So what are we finding in advanced cancer? And this is a summary of a lot of work, and I'll go through some examples, but really we're finding that around 5% of patients have microsatellite instability. And this is important because uh, for microsatellite instability, these patients would be candidates for immunotherapy. And this is not prostate cancer specific. This is specific for any cancer type that has MSI or microsatellite instability. Around 10% of the patients we, we see have germline DNA repair mutations in BRCA1 or 2, most commonly BRCA2 and ATM. And these are patients that are candidates for PARP inhibition or platinum-based therapies. And then if we consider both the somatic and the germline, and the somatic must likely be taken from a metastatic biopsy, uh, we can get up to 20% in some populations. So where's the data coming from? Well, we have a stand-up to cancer study that was run five uh, institutions, uh, including the Royal Marsden in the UK and, and the United States. And in this study, one of the, I think, first findings that we reported was a high frequency of DNA repair mutations. 
And um, this has been, I think, an important um, uh, story to follow as we see as much as 20% DNA repair mutations that are related to BRCA2, ATM, and other DNA repair genes, as well as some case with microsatellite instability. We know from a long uh, standing work from uh, Alan Ashworth and others that this is also creating an opportunity because now that you have mutations in BRCA2, in ovarian, breast, and other cancers, you can use this to then create a synthetic lethality by using PARP inhibitors that are being developed, and there are a number of them available. And this has led to a series of studies uh, led by um, Johan de Bono and others looking at the use of PARP inhibitors in the context of a number of diseases and then specifically in prostate cancer. And this was a game-changing study that was reported where approximately 30 percent of the patients with advanced prostate cancer responded to a PARP, and this is the QPARP trial. Um, and particularly um, interesting was the observation that patients who responded tend to have um, alterations in one of the DNA repair genes. And in this study, uh, BRCA2, ATM, but also others like FANCA, FANC-A were found to be altered. This led our Stand Up to Cancer group to then survey how frequent were, frequent were these mutations, both in the somatic and germline. And this study focused on germline alterations from uh, several cohorts. The bottom line is we found a frequency as high as 20% in patients that had no family history of uh, DNA repair alteration. So these were not patients whose family member had a BRCA2 mutation and were referred to uh, Royal Marsden or to Memorial Sloan Kettering. These were patients who had no family history. Um, and this is, appears to be uh, obviously a very high percentage with DNA repair alterations. I think the important follow-up to this was the reporting of the PROFOUND trial this year and, um, and other trials that are showing similar results, and that is, is that if you use as a biomarker uh, DNA repair alterations, in this example, looking at BRCA2, BRCA1, or ATM in this cohort, you can see that patients who have these alterations respond significantly better to PARP inhibition. So it represents an opportunity for a biomarker-driven trial, but a biomarker-driven approach to treating men with advanced prostate cancer. Just as a side note, uh, this study um, had a very large number, over 4,000 men were, were enrolled in the study. Um, unfortunately, because of the way the testing was done, and this is not really a knock on, any, on the particular um, type of test that was done, which was the foundation test, but it's just the requirement for tissue was such that ar around only 69% of the, of the samples that were sent could be evaluated. So a significant percentage of the samples could not be evaluated. So obviously we have to improve that from the pathology side. I wasn't sure if today we'd have the announcement yet, but sometime in the next weeks I would predict that the FDA is going to approve PARP for prostate cancer therapy. I don't know which one, probably Elaparib will be approved first. And I, I think that it'll be obviously for indication of BRCA2 and ATM mutations. And this is going to be a real game changer as far as how molecular pathology is going to have to deal with that. And I don't have an answer today for how we're going to deal with that, but it would suggest that all patients with advanced prostate cancer will need to have some uh, significant genomic. They looked using their micro um, satellite instability assay, which is the 
impact assay, which is a broad genomic test, very similar to foundation, but it captures both tumor and normal, so germline. They were able to identify patients who had MSI, but just the cautionary note is that if you look at all the patients that were identified who have microsatelline stability and put on to immunotherapy, only a subset of those individuals, not 100 percent, responded to therapy. And so I think what's important is, is that MSI uh, may be an indication, but it's not going to be a perfect predictor of who's going to respond. So this needs to be improved over time. So this is the uh, summary, the consensus for uh, the working group. So really in um, localized cancer, there's some indications for when we think uh, germline and uh, somatic testing may be important from microsatellite and also for germline repair alterations. And, in, and very likely uh, the, the FDA and other organizations will approve PARP for advanced disease, which will require uh, testing. I, I, I'm not making an advertisement for this company, but I just want to point out that there are companies that offer relatively inexpensive germline testing for BRCA2, BRCA1, and other uh, germ DNA repair genes. Uh, but the important point is that whatever test is used, it has to be able to provide clinical grade information. And so um, this may not be a test that's run locally, and so it's something that has to be thought about, and also it needs to be done in the context of genetic counseling. So just uh, 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 moving forward uh, towards really wrapping up on some other important topics for advanced cancer, so androm receptor. So we know androm receptor is extremely important. Uh, how are we going to use this clinically? So if you go to any meeting now, you're going to hear a lot about uh, splice variants and they're being targeted and how we can use them clinically. Um, so that's obviously been very important and it's quite exciting. And the idea is that the V7 splice variant has lost the ligand binding domain. And so this is considered predictive of patients who may not respond to AR targeted therapy. Um, there are a number of ways that this can be assessed. And so one of them is through liquid biopsies. And there are a number of liquid biopsy approaches that are underway, so looking at cell-free DNA, looking at cells that are circulating and capturing them, so circulating tumor cells. I think probably most robust right now are assays that are just looking at the amount of circulating DNA as a prognostic marker to say which patients are not going to do well. And that's relatively easy to perform in patients who are very low-grade uh, let's say localized cancer, you probably wouldn't detect very much DNA at all. But in most patients with advanced prostate cancer, you can detect significant amounts of circulating DNA. And these have been shown in this study and other studies uh, that they correspond very nicely with how patients do. So this is a prognostic biomarker. There have also been another, a, a number of nice studies um, that have looked at um, evaluating the androm receptor and how that predicts patients' response to therapy, and this has also worked well. So splice variants, androm receptor being assessed in the blood are probably important biomarkers. And here's just another example, a recent example from Garrett Artard's, Artard's group where they showed this. Now, um, this in their study, they were able to show that copy number was associated with response, and that's quite useful. So the summary, though, is that we have a number of tests that can assess the androm receptor, and they're probably quite important. Uh, AR gain is probably one of the best uh, methods, but also splice variants are being used. The problem is most of these tests are not really ready to uh, be used in the clinical setting in a standard way um, because of the issue of reproducibility, and there's a lot of confusion about this in the field right now. And so what um, the recommendation really right now is, is that we think this is extremely promising, but we need to really lock down what are the best tests and, and really have prospective trials to show that. Last uh, important topic I just want to cover is the concept of neuroendocrine prostate cancer. This is becoming uh, something that's more and more recognized. Here's an example of a localized cancer where a pathologist stained it for synaptophysin, so a, a neuroendocrine marker, and then is, has this complex issue of what is this, because it, for the pathologist, it doesn't look like a, a small cell cancer. And here's something that looks like a small cell cancer very clearly. Now, what we're finding in the precision medicine trials are that if you look consistently in patients with advanced prostate cancer, CRPC cancers, 
uh, we see anywhere from 11% to 17% in two large uh, trials that have looked at patients in the context of uh, standard of care uh, for m most of these are patients who failed abiraterone or enzalutamide. The terminology is increasing, so we're seeing more and more papers where people are using the term small cell or neuroendocrine. And I just wanted to show this picture of uh, Professor Leonard, who was uh, asked to come up with a classification of lymphomas uh, a long time ago, smiling. I, I don't think we're right there yet for defining small cell and can smile the same way. Um, what's happened here is he went from a relatively simple classification to a more complex one. And so what we're recognizing is for advanced prostate cancer, we probably need to incorporate more molecular testing. Here's an example from small cell lung cancer, where instead of just looking under the microscope, we also need to think about a lot of uh, molecular tests that are corresponding to that. And here's just an example of something that looks like a small cell cancer. It's positive for PSA, but it's not positive for synaptophysin or chromogranin. So it's a fairly confusing field. We know some things about the disease tends to be enriched for P53 and RB, uh, but um, otherwise we have some extremely confounding data. And the one I just want to highlight is if we plot AR signaling, and these are all individual cases here from a precision medicine trial that we recently reported on, and we report neuroendocrine score going in this direction is higher, we clearly have cases here that look like this. So these are small cell cancers that your pathologist would report, but we can see they have high AR signaling. And so what we really need to define is what are hormone responsive advanced prostate cancers. And right now we recognize that pathology alone is not sufficient, and some of the molecular testing that we're doing is not sufficient. So I think this is important. We know that they're enriched for some types of mutations, but um, I think this is going to be one of the key things that we need to be able to address in the near future. So um, for neuroendocrine um, prostate cancer, just summarize that for localized disease, we really don't want to just use immunostochemistry to define it. And for advanced disease, we recognize we're going to have to have more molecular testing to help define that. Um, I'll go through that quickly. So. Unlike our colleagues who are taking care of patients with lung cancer, we don't have FDA-approved tests uh, currently available. Um, there are a lot of exciting things coming up that I haven't spoken about. Obviously, we'll hear about PSMA. Um, uh, CDK12 loss is, is an important uh, factor for potentially uh, seeing patients who may respond to immunotherapy. But really, we only have these two areas that are, I think, um, going to be approved within uh, the 2020 for uh, advanced cancer. And that would be for microsatellite instability, which is already approved, but not specifically for prostate. And then um, we should hear very shortly about approval for DNA repair, uh, uh, that is PARP uh, treatment for patients with BRCA1 or 2 or ATM alterations. And most of the other things I discussed today are interesting and exciting, and in some meetings, uh, it, they work in some centers, but are not all centers. Um, and these need to be really improved. And I think the most promising certainly would be detecting our, uh, whether it's in the blood somehow, um, androm receptor or splice variants that would help us understand the prognosis, but also whether it's a predictive as to whether patients are still going to respond to AR-targeted therapy. So I just want to uh, acknowledge the members of the working group that we had that led to these some of the consensus comments that I just made. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Recommendations in place. Authorized carriers of prostate cancer. 
Yeah, so I'm, I, I, I was really focusing on advanced disease and what, what I, so if I was asked what to do, I would, I would certainly would say that somebody should have testing based on the high frequency that we're seeing it. I think very, very shortly there'll be an FDA approval for PARP in that setting. And then I guess the only question, and I don't think it's a major question, but I do think that there are gonna be other DNA repair genes that are mutated at low frequency. So, I mean, you're, setting at Martini Clinic, you probably see a lot of patients. You'll probably have patients that'll, that'll represent a significant number, even though that's only one or two percent that might have a FANCA A mutation. And they may respond, so we, that's not gonna probably be approved. So I think, um, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be quite straightforward at the end of 2020 that for BRCA2, BRCA1, ATM, we have to test, but the test will be broader, so we'll probably also capture these other DNA repair genes. Thank you. Uh, it's a great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, as a clinician, we have the daily problem to identify patients for active surveillance. We right. do it still on the basis of the Gleason grade and the number of positive biopsies, but we know, and this is proven, that at least 25-30% will have more aggressive tumor. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any hope that gene analysis will help us? even in the face of tumor heterogeneity, or is a, can you make a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, at the, at the, as you're very, very well aware, I mean, a sampling is probably the biggest issue, right? And so um, I, I think that um, in the systematic studies that we're doing for precision medicine, we have patients who have advanced disease and we're going back and looking at their prostatectomies and trying to figure out what was the lesion that uh, led to the met metastatic disease. And sometimes it's very obvious. So sometimes we know what the index lesion is and sometimes we don't. And so I think this is an area where we still need to uh, learn more from patients with advanced disease to help answer the question. Um, I know that you take extensive biopsies so that the information is probably there. We just don't know how to determine it. But let me just make one additional comment. We know that when we look at the patients with advanced disease, they have P53 alterations, they have RB1 alterations, P10, and I know in your institution um, you've, you've been studying this for a long time. We, we're not at the point yet where we can say this is you know, something we use clinically, but most likely you know, if you have a P53 mutation at time of initial diagnosis, not a good sign. So we, we, need, we need just more evidence for that. I have a question about the profound study which you showed comparing Laparib versus Enzalutinibity. I mean, it had an impressive hazard ratio of 0.3, but the two curves came together quite rapidly after 18 months. Is that resistance development? Is this heterogeneity? So what is explaining this? Yeah, I this don't, I mean, as a pathologist, molecular pathologist is not gonna comment on that, so I'm not, I don't, I, I know that we have um, others here that might want to comment on it, but I don't, I'm not sure. I know that there are long-term responders so I don't know. Is reproducibility of these new markers uh, from lab to lab different or not working? What, what is that? I'm sorry. Re the reproducibility of these uh, tests, of these yeah. new why is that not working from labor laboratory to laboratory? Well, I mean, first of all, in many of our research meetings, there's tremendous enthusiasm for individuals to present your exciting new data. So I think that's, we see that a lot. But the rigor that is required to get something into, you know, clinical use is, is often not applied in that setting. And so the problem is I think we're seeing things that are potentially useful, but they just haven't been rigorously done. Now, there are some that are approved, and they work, but often only in, they haven't gained wide, wide acceptance. And so I think we need to design the trials to actually compare the testing. Um, specifically for the splice variant, so the V7, I think there's tremendous enthusiasm for that. But I would note that in most of the trials, they don't look at androgen receptor amplification or mutation status simultaneously. And I would argue that probably that would be sufficient. I mean, if you know what's going on with the androgen receptor, and um, I would argue also that that's probably an easier 
and more reproducible tests. So these need to be compared side by side, but I, you know, I, there's tremendous debate as to what works and what's, I, I think they're prognostic right now, so probably as prognostic markers, they work, but as predictive markers, they may not work. And um, yeah, so there, so I think we need more rigor in, the, in that area. Okay, if there's no more questions, thanks a lot for the exciting overview. And I would...